The Gawa is one of the most difficult and challenging factions to play in the game of Scythe, and for quite some time I've been asked to make a tutorial on the faction in general, not just the individual mats and combinations. I had the opportunity to bring on an excellent Tagawa player on the channel, and we talked and discussed how to play the Tagawa faction in quite some detail. We were able to live stream it and we had some great times, both talking about the faction and answering Q&A with the viewers who joined us. If you missed it, I hope you get the chance to watch it now and enjoy it. I split the stream into two parts. This is part one where we talk about general strategies for Tagawa. Part two will address the individual mats for Tagawa. So stay tuned for that as well. Thanks, guys. For those of you familiar with the side competitive scene, the player joining me tonight needs no introduction, but this is Mr. Durr. He's a two-time tournament champion winner and quite honestly has a soft spot in his heart for Tagawa and as a result I think he's one of the best if not the best Tagawa players in the world so I asked him to to join me tonight we've been talking about this for a while passing notes kind of back and forth and really been looking forward to talking with you guys about Tagawa as a faction so without further ado uh, I'll kick it over to you Dur to to get us started on on the faction we love to hate. <laughs> in general, uh, Tagawa is probably the reason why they're diff the hard to play is uh, they probably have the weakest movement abilities in the game. They don't have speed and they don't have fancy movement like you can get with Rally and Albion. Um, so what ends up happening is they kind of just slowly creep about the around the board. And uh, if you ever lose your position on the board, it's very hard to recover that position. So they're just very unforgiving in terms of uh, making movement mistakes or engine building mistakes. Um, so it kind of requires a little bit more foresight and analysis of the board than most factions do, uh, just so, because they're vulnerable. So, so let me ask you about that um, real quick. You, draw, you drew a distinction right there between Rally and Tagawa's movement speed, Shinobi, where they move to traps. What, what in your mind makes Shinobi sort of, I think you alluded to it, a weaker movement skill than, than Rally? What are, its, what are Shinobi's limitations that make it difficult to work around? Right. Well, basically, Shinobi only being able to move to traps means you can only return to a position you previously had essentially um there's no like advancing past it once you move back to a trap whereas with rally you can do some really powerful movement where like you move to a flag and then move a worker off and then move another unit to that worker so you can actually kind of move forward uh even when you're teleporting back to a flag and also if you bring a worker with a mech uh when you're attacking you can just bring two other mechs with uh using rally so you can attack with three units anywhere essentially you have a worker on a mech so there's some really powerful attacking and uh just offensive movement yeah things you can do with rally so with but. rally basically you don't have to have been somewhere already with your character to go there whereas with right. shinobi the character physically has to have been there before mm -hmm. before you can shinobi to it which which makes it weaker i, I think i think that's good yeah that's a because I, I think it's easy to think of those two abilities as being almost mirror images of each other, but in some ways, as you point out, they're really not. Mm -hmm. But of uh, course, mm -hmm. of course, I know you wanted to talk about the traps because that's, I think that's what stands out and makes Tagawa as unique, one of the most unique factions is the dynamic of the traps. Yeah, I guess the uh, trade-off for a uh, rally in shinobi is that traps are much more annoying than flags are so the uh the first tip is to uh remember to place your traps uh new players almost always forget to place traps or they save them uh thinking that they'll place them later but really in reality you only move like six or seven times in a game and since you can only place one trap per movement you know, maybe you only have two moves where you're not placing traps. So essentially the default is if you're moving, you should probably just place the trap. Um, so and, uh, Scott in chat asks, in, in kind of in line with that, if you're moving, place a trap. Scott in chat asks, 
how often do you put traps on the spaces next to your home base? Um, is it is it about claiming a territory? Is it about preventing early attack? What, what do you consider when you're deciding whether to place a trap on your home next to your home base? Um, it's usually the only place I would really put it is on the tundra next to your home base if you have like Palania in the game. Because that's, yeah, that's typically a territory that Polania can attack through the lake. Um, also, it's useful if you want to, like, there's some weird openings where you can, like, shinobi to that trap to, like, get a bunch of, to move your wor more workers to oil. Um, would be the only other reason. But, um, yeah, that's, like, a very, that would be a very safe play to do. Uh, but not, typically, I wouldn't put a trap next to my um but there are some situations where it's called for i think that's a a good point with polania or inner attacking through the lake that's a a pretty good context mm -hmm. or situation i i know that i've i've certainly been concerned about that space in games before um kind of felt that space was just sort of naked and open to polania um another thing to consider is if you think you're actually going to have it's it controls it at the end of the game so if you don't think you're going to have a worker on that tundra it is actually still controlling it i know there's been a few games where i've debated putting a trap there and i realized i would have won the game if i had one more territory and had placed a oh, trap wow. there yeah. i think so like you know it, it really to you, I was kind of crazy because you have to think so far down the line a lot of the time but so, uh so some of it comes down to whether or not then you're planning on having a worker on that tundra long term right because if there's going to be a worker there that's just going to get surrounded by other workers and there's no place to take it, um, right. the trap's not going to be an extra territory. But if you're going to move off that space and leave it by itself, that extra territory could come in handy late in the game. Mm -hmm. So as people who have played Tagawa are pretty familiar with, you, you've got the four traps and you've got, starting with the metal encounter, the quickest way to the factory is one, two, three, four spaces to the factory with either the lake or that second mountain being where you go through. So I feel like that's a really common pathway that people lay their traps when they can. What do you think about, and uh, um, got some questions in chat about, about trap priority, sort of what are you thinking about, assuming you're trying to get to the factory and you're taking a pathway similar to this. I mean, it's also four spaces to go through the, the forest or the village tunnel and just kind of walk us through the significance of these different hexes and what traps you consider putting down as you travel through these hexes yeah this is a great uh question it's actually the next point but uh we uh a, a big part of it is just being aware of who can attack you and what kind of cards and power they have so for instance um, the card combat card trap and the power trap are both very powerful early in the game, but they're not so great later on. So your main concern with placing traps on your path to the factory is to not let your character get sent home. Because once it's sent home, it's not getting to the factory. Mm -hmm. This is not happening. So like you have to be really, really careful about not uh, making your character vulnerable. And uh, that's why a lot of it's often safer. A lot of people just take the the land route to the factory, but it's typically safer for your character to move to the uh, lake next to the factory instead of the mountain. Um, but of course you have to deploy Soiton instead of whatever, whatever other mech um, in order to do that. So, and of course but, uh, that, that can leave you, that could especially be a good play, right? If you're one of maybe the only lake faction or maybe the, the lake factions don't have a lot of power and you've already used a, a trap on that tundra you could move to that lake without having to use a trap getting sent home on that lake without a trap placed would be brutal but at least you have the protection of the being able to play two combat cards on a lake right right yeah so um choosing what trap to place where is really just a matter of sit like the sit the board situation um and whether it, a trap will like help you win a combat or not um because your main goal is just basically to not have your character sent home um but yeah 
So in that case, so that first trap on that mountain, if I'm staring down, say, a quick Saxony or Polania, um, Polania starts with three combat cards, Saxony starts with four, they start with two and one power. Um, the combat card trap in that, in that scenario might be much more punishing for them than the power trap, right? Whereas... Yeah, I mean, yes. Typically, the combat card trap is the best one to place first. Um, however, the first law of traps is that the first trap flipped is always the coin trap. So, I mean, that's kind of the... A... And when you say <laughs> that, you mean the opponent always has to be prepared for hitting a coin trap. Because the coin yes. trap can be the most punishing trap in the game. And especially placed on somewhere like the factory where Tagawa's in a position to keep retaking it. I mean, three battles on the factory, 12 points, that's, that's more than the factory's worth, even in, even in uh, Tier 3. So this, uh, I kind of think of this village tunnel as kind of being a significant spot from, mm -hmm. of exit for Rusviet of potential attack from Crimea and Saxony. Do you ever just do you ever just like throw away a trap like the popularity trap or something early? Um just kind of bluffing Saxony or Polania to leave you alone long enough to get to that tunnel and lay down that combat card tra trap for like a Crimea or something like that? Yeah, there's uh yeah, there's I mean, I don't want to give away my trap placing secrets, but <laughs> the first trap I always place is basically the popularity trap every time on that mountain. Um however there are situations where I feel like Saxony is definitely gonna attack me and I'll put like a combat card trap. Right. But uh in general you wanna be a little greedy because that, that combat card trap is so valuable early on. Um you really don't want to waste it. And um the power trap can also be very good when you get Ronin. Um, it's pretty common to get Ronin as your first mech because it helps protect your character uh, for combat when it's alone on a trap. And if you have a power trap plus Ronin, it's a five power swing right at the start of the combat, which is a pretty big deal. But and, uh, you know, if and, opponents don't have power, then it doesn't do anything. So, And I guess one of the I, reasons we're talking about the popularity trap is almost a throwaway trap. Is that because on the online digital edition, the meta has so shifted to a tier one rush the game meta that the popularity mm -hmm. trap does almost nothing. Um, right. I remember in a year or two ago when this game was in the Discord was predominantly played on TTS, it was very mm -hmm. common to see the popularity trap on the factory, right? Yeah, it was the opposite. Which is funny, yeah. Now, I think we can um, we can start talking about uh, movement a little bit. Yeah, because uh, Tagawa really has to focus on moving a lot more than more so than other factions, and it has to do with a little bit what we mentioned about um, not really having very many movement options. You basically just have to move to whatever is adjacent to you. There's no other thing you can do except for teleporting back to your traps. But um, getting a move upgrade is a really uh, good idea. It's, I would say it's almost uh, like a necessary thing to do. Um, like, uh, and the reason is that uh, in order to really fully use your faction ability, you have to move a lot and you want that action to be as efficient as possible. Um, and uh, also, Tagawa has a hard time gaining a lot of territory because uh, it's difficult to spread out without the extra movement things as well. So you really need that upgraded move to get a decent territory count and uh, other things. So, yeah. Yep. Um, yep. So also, it can be very difficult to uh, uh, do like territory control objectives or it can be much harder. And you kind of have to like plan ahead with your movement. Uh, in, for instance, if you had, what are our objectives here? Divide and conquer. Uh, you want two territories adjacent to the factory. Well, you need to have, you know, two units that are adjacent to those territories in order to get it. 
you know, whereas most factions have speed or other things they can do, um, it can be tricky to sort of plan ahead to actually do those things. Yeah. Um, Territory based encounters are definitely much more difficult with Tagawa. I never get more excited than when I get uh, diversify, and I know I can yeah. just put workers on these these five territories yeah. just right here. So with um, so talking about movement, you're going to be moving the workers by themselves a lot, right? Because the the workers don't really have any more well, I should say any less movement ability than the mechs as far as right. distance. So I, yeah. I guess that's why that upgraded move action is such a big deal. So I, I think we'll, we can talk a little bit more about when we look at the individual boards about how to go about getting that initial, initial upgrade. So what else would you say? Say you have to plan your movement ahead. What are the types of things that you think about early in the game when you're planning a movement are you looking at the other factions on the board are you looking at early risks what what's going through your mind what what factions are you looking for what abilities are what you looking for what are you keeping an eye out for as you plan your initial moves right well at the start it's mostly just about trying to get your engine started getting your workers to the resources you want um and that's another penalty not having speed makes that a little bit more complicated um you often have to walk workers from one territory to another um just because your mech can't do it for them uh so primarily in the first seven ish turns you're just thinking about trying to get your workers to the resources you want one of the nice things about tagawa is you actually do have um three different resources next to your village which is uh the only faction that really has that mm. uh, i guess so does uh, Rusfiat in a way, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> so they they have to uh, river walk to it. They can't just right, they can't yeah. just move the workers. Um. So yeah, because of that, because there's no river, you can uh, walk your workers to your resources. Um, but in terms of paying attention to other factions, you're looking for anybody who has river walk and speed, uh, or if Saxony is the game underpass and speed. You're basically just watching for whenever you think the first time somebody will be able to attack you is. So if they're going to deploy their mech next turn to get Riverwalk, and then they can maybe move the turn after that. You're thinking about those sorts of things to try and uh, either move out of the way or move to a less, you know, uh, attractive position to like attack um, things like that. So I guess but, uh, underpass is a big one to look for. Perhaps yeah. a greedy Polania with an early mine. Um, That's also very scary, yes. Be a, <laughs> because Polania yeah. would love to beat you to that encounter. Um, mm -hmm. I always kind of question the wisdom of beating Tagawa to that encounter as Polania because it puts you that much farther away from a factory card. But mm -hmm. I have... I have uh, I've played Polania before, who is willing to take that hit to steal the encounter from me. So I guess it's mm -hmm. something to look out for. Um, so I got got some questions about choosing the right trap and combat awareness. Um, mm -hmm. Adam in chat asks, if there's no Saxony, would you just skip the trap on the mountain and try to make it to that village before laying down a trap? The only, the only reason you do that is if you thought that you're basically for sure going to get to the factory. Um, and the reason is after you use your factory card, probably by moving your character, you can place a trap in an interesting spot. Um, or if you think that you're going to control the mountain with the unit anyway at the end of the game, so it's kind of just going to be a wasted territory. But in general, I don't. I would... It's a risky move to do because you might not place, you might not move again for three or four turns. And like I said, the game, the situation on the board might develop to the point where somebody might actually be able to attack you that you didn't think was going to be able to attack you. Um, so only do that if you're very sure that nobody is actually going to be able to attack you there. Um, but yeah, it is, it's a, I would, I don't do that very often is what I would say. But yeah. Yeah. So uh, chat chat points out that to, Scott points out in chat that Tagawa seems to live in fear of a fast Saxony. So 
And, and I think that's right. You, there's, yeah. there's not much more of a sinking feeling in this game, except maybe getting, you know, Albion Mechanical, than to stare down a Saxony Industrial or a Saxony Innovative when mm -hmm. you're sitting on, on Tagawa. Is that, is that a situation where you start seriously considering one of those traps on, next to the home base? Or, yeah. I mean, you're counting the turns, you're counting the turns until you get to that encounter and hopefully, hopefully they leave you alone. And, and so we, we wanted to talk about selection of mech and you mentioned Ronan earlier as a good, solid beginning um, mm -hmm. mech. When you're potentially getting rushed by, I, I keep coming back to Polania, um, but Nordic can do it too. Um, sometimes Nordic sandwich between Albion and Rusvia likes to come down and set up on this village and block you from the factory. So there's yeah. all these threats that can hit you early. Um, what, when, what I was going to ask you is how do you balance the choice between uh, what I assume are some of the best early mech options being Ronin and Shinobi? How do you kind of weigh the the pros and cons of that extra power versus being able to right. come right back and hit someone who knocks you off a spot. Yeah, I can go through briefly what each mech as a first mech would be good for. Ronin is good as a first mech just because it makes your character harder to send home. I kind of mentioned that already uh, because your character tends to be alone on its path to the factory. So if you have Ronin with it, it makes it a harder thing to kill or send back home. Um, but shinobi is also uh, is maybe just as much of a deterrent because you can counterattack. Uh, so the combination of Ronin and shinobi is typically very powerful for uh, like discouraging people from attacking you because they'll have to hit a trap. They'll they'll do Ronin, and then you can counterattack and get Ronin again. And it's like it's so much power uh, that they're most likely going to be sent home from your counterattack. So there's a little bit of a, a dissuasion there. But um, probably the, the spiciest one is Toka because you can harass Crimea and Rusfiat with it. Mm. Um, so that's something that is actually a pretty valid strategy a good portion of the time if you think that they're going to be slow to their encounters, uh, which some of the different player mats are sometimes. Um, and just to be a thorn in their side, um, that's usually the only reason I would take Toka is to be really aggressive um, first. Uh, and I would say that probably Soitan is the safest mech. And it, it, it's a little bit of a combination of you can also harass Rusfit with Soitan by moving to uh, that lake right there. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can also, instead of taking the land path of the factory, it's much safer to typically go to the mountain, woods, and uh, lake here. And uh, the benefit that has is you can place a trap on this wood territory if you are trying to actually build, um, which will protect that more. This is usually a very vulnerable um, hex on the board because of, of being in between the tunnels. But if you put a place, if you place a trap there, maybe uh, people will think twice about uh, attacking it. So and so it's, it's, it's vulnerable, of, but it's not worth as much. I mean, you think a lot. You think of a game like chess, where they say the center of the board is more important, and we all kind of have this sense, whether we verbalize it or not, that tunnels are more valuable spaces because they connect to more spaces on the board. So right. it's always a little bit nicer, for instance, to get to eight workers on this village tunnel than down here on this village between the tunnels. So right. this forest hex, you, I think you're right that it's vulnerable, but I'd also suggest and. Let, tell me if you agree with this, that there's less incentive to hit you on that space. Because mm -hmm. if I bring three workers to this forest, well, now where do I take them? Deeper into Tagawa's base? I can't drop one on this lake. It's not, I mean, if I take this village tunnel or this um, tundra tunnel, great, I have lots of places to go. But if I get pinned on this wood spot, I mean, other than disrupting Tagawa, why do I even want to be there? Right. I mean, the only reason would be to, like, steal the wood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you have, like, an industrial Saxony or a mechanical somebody, they might just steal it so they could build a building with it, which is points. Um, but, yeah, in general, the village is uh, a much more valuable space, uh, the village tunnel, 
a lot of factions typically want to actually use that village uh to put produce workers on and then spread out from so um if you can control that as Tikawa, it's a great tactical advantage um for producing your own workers but also if you deploy a bunch of mechs on that village tunnel it's a good spot for you to sort of attack from um which is one of the harder things with Tigawa is actually being able to attack people effectively is really difficult sometimes uh so you have to sort of position yourself aggressively on the board to actually be able to attack anybody a good portion of the time especially if you don't have a factory card so um yeah that village tunnel is a very important spot so do you ever consider putting something like the coin trap or a popularity trap on that village tunnel just for the sole purpose of messing with Rusviet? Yeah, I mean, there is the popularity trap can actually be a big pain in the butt if like you're putting them to zero and they still want to produce at eight workers, so they won't be able to produce. There is actually some reason to do that. It would I would be surprised if somebody does that, but uh, I have seen people put the coin trap on that village uh, pretty often actually, because um, there is a point like I said where the combat card trap and the power trap they don't really do that much later in the game. So uh, if you're thinking like down the road and you're trying to like maybe bluff that you place the combat, combat card trap and you know nobody's going to attack you, you know, you could maybe put the coin trap or something there. Um, so there's definitely significant mind games with what traps you put where. But uh, yeah. I know you wanted to talk about the lakes and sort of how much power lakes give to Gawa. They're one of three lake factions. As we know, Lani and Nordic being the others, but you feel like lakes give Tagawa a, a real big advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lakes are pretty important. Um, if there's no other lake faction in the game, they're basically the safe spots. Kind of continuing this point, I was just saying that like it's hard to attack people as Tagawa. Well, if you have a bunch of mechs randomly on lakes on the board, it puts you in a much better position to possibly attack anybody who's next to a lake. So. Uh, it's a nice position where nobody can attack you, but then you can attack from that territory. Um, so that's really nice. But also when there's la other lake factions in the game, um, just putting a single mech on a lake when you have Ronin and Soitan is just such a pain in the butt to attack because you get the extra power and you get to spend two combat cards. And if there's a trap on there too, it's like it's such a it's such a annoying thing to attack. And uh it can uh, just even placing a combat unit, for instance, on this lake next to your home base, even if you can't win the combat, it prevents them from, say, Polania moving into your territories and stealing your resources. So it can be just a preventative, just put a blocker in the way to stop uh, their mechs from uh, stealing your stuff. Yeah, and I um, think that's a general um, a move phenomenon. I'm glad you bring that up that new players overlook is that sometimes having a combat unit somewhere doesn't just the power of blocking with a combat unit because you yeah. think well you know i can put a combat unit here but i'm just going to lose the fight well if they can only move every other turn then mm -hmm. you've turned them being able to move to a spot into up to three turns for them to get to that spot which as we right. know is just an age and um an eon inside so yeah, I mm -hmm. think that's a really good point. You mentioned bringing single mechs onto lakes. I, I think that's something sort of different with Tagawa. We often see Nordic and Polania carting lots of workers onto those lakes. But right. I think when you have speed mech, tell me if you agree with this, when you have speed, I hit my mic just then, when you have speed and you have workers on the lake, you can double move, drop a worker on to a land spot and then move back to a lake. <laughs> But when you're just moving one space, you can't leave a worker behind. So right. why have yeah, workers with really. those mechs on the lakes to begin with? All they do is right. take away the ability to use Ronin, right? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, there's no real reason to bring workers on the lakes unless you just want to make like a popularity penalty for attacking it or something. Mm -hmm. um, or have, or possibly spread out. So for instance, you carry the worker off the lake and then you move the worker um, as well afterward but um yeah generally you don't bring very many workers on the lakes to Tagawa. that's a good point um, yeah. i don't think i realized that but yeah 
So while so, we're talking about movement, I know, and this is one of the things that that is even kind of, I'll say I have a little bit of trouble wrapping my mind around. And one of the things that really oppresses me about your Tagawa game is you seem to be able to make this work. And that is people who've been around this game for a long time know that most of the time when you're rushing the game, you're going for your enlists, your max, your, uh, your worker star, your objective, and your two combats, and you're looking to get in and out of the game as quickly as possible. But I know you're a big believer in, especially with the IFA factions, or maybe with the IFA factions, going for those bottom row actions, maybe even the star that's underneath your movement abilities. So with this patriotic mat that we have out here right now, that would be the uh, the upgrade star, and yeah. I I you know I rarely get the upgrade star. Um, I Rusviet Engineering comes to mind for me occasionally, Melania Patriotic, but uh, I've seen you get the. I mean, we played a game and in a tournament once, and you came a couple power away from ending the game in fifteen turns with the upgrade star as Tagawa. And that just yeah. that just blew my mind. So talk a little bit about um, prioritizing that bottom row action, and when you when when you look at it and say, "Hey, how, how do you? What are you thinking about at the beginning of the game when you're considering whether to go for that sort of unusual star underneath your movement action, and mm -hmm. how you go about setting yourself up to do it?" Right. Yeah. So. Uh, patriotic is a great example i'm glad we uh put this one out um it it seems like kind of a weird thing to do but the really the essence is that your faction ability has to do with moving so if you want to utilize your faction ability you want to you should probably be doing the bottom action below move because you're going to be doing a whole bunch of turns without doing bottom actions which is really inefficient so in general it's just a good idea in terms of efficiency to uh, do that bottom action. And uh, for patriotic in, uh, as an example, um, it affords some other interesting engine building opportunities because you want the, as Tagawa, you want the move upgrade, but you also want the power upgrade, but because you can't move your workers very effectively at the start of the game, you kind of also want the produce upgrade so like those three are all very good for Tagawa. Um, and on top of that, so if you're going to get three, you might as well just finish it. It's kind of the idea. It's like the, if you're uh, going to go down that path. Um, if so, you need three, the upgrade star turns into a three bottom row action star instead of a six bottom row action star. If you're already getting three of them either way. And the other reason I like uh, upgrading for Tagawa is this worker, uh, the, probably the most uh, common opening is just to move the character out and a worker to the village, which leaves a worker on the, the tundra. Um, and this, this brings up a point that uh, I don't think I've made yet, but when you move, you almost always want to move your character. I don't know of very many openings for Tagawa where you wouldn't move the character in the first turn, like moving both of your workers like this. Um, I know there's some weird ones that do that, but like in general, I almost never do that um, because it's just so valuable to place the traps on the board and get to the encounter, especially if somebody's racing you there. <laughs> so um, yeah, if you're not, if you're moving your character and your work to the village, then you have a worker on the tundra that's just always going to be there. So. It just happens that with uh, patriotic, it's just kind of works out to get an upgrade star um, with the way that the uh, home base is oriented. Um, yeah. So. Well, I think I think that um, that covers it for most of the sort of basic strategies we wanted to talk about. Unless there's anything else you you wanted to add to that. Um, I know with advanced strategies, we've um, we're going to get into um, mm -hmm. the another weird thing. Stuff. Another thing that kind of just blows my mind a little bit, which is you wanted to talk about the three worker strat. I know we're going to talk about the factory a little bit, um, but let's let's start with the the three worker strat. 
Um, talk to us a little bit about when you're going to consider going for three workers and why you're going to do that. Um, sometimes it has to do with objective, but one of the one of the uh, advantages of three worker strategies is you you do move to this encounter more quickly generally. So if you're worried about somebody stealing it, or if you're worried about uh, getting to the factory fast enough, you typically don't have to fuss about moving your workers as much. You don't you spend fewer times producing, so it kind of shortens your time to get to the factory, which in some games can be a huge a huge deal um but the typical disadvantages of doing a three worker strategy uh are sort of offset by the traps um because the biggest disadvantage with three worker strategy is that you just can't control as many territories at the end of the game you have fewer units to spread out and that's a lot of points to lose but because tagawa has four territories they can uh control on their own um it mitigates that quite a bit and it is different from Albion because you have to control your flags as Albion. So you could think of your traps as sort of like more powerful workers for controlling uh, territories at the end of the game. It's um, three workers plus four traps, that's seven workers. Right, exactly. And then on top of that, if you build structures or you have max, you have more than enough units to get a decent territory score. Um, and uh, the other side of it is because you start with zero power, sometimes fussing with trying to get power so you can produce with five workers or eight workers is just such a pain. And it slows down the, how quickly you can build an engine. Uh, so typically, uh, so sometimes just avoiding that whole power situation um, can be just better. And um, in even some more rare situations, it actually can help you get a power star. If you um, somehow enlist upgrade and maybe your neighbor's upgrade, say maybe you have engineering as your neighbor or some other map that upgrades a couple times and you yourself upgrade because you have the Tundra worker, like all that power starts adding up. And then because you're not spending it with, uh, you know, producing, that actually ends adds up to quite a lot of power and then on top of it you have rune and then you can start doing all these crazy things at the end of the game to maybe get a power star and you didn't even bolster once in the game so like there's a lot of interesting things that can happen uh when you do three workers so basically it, to replace the worker star would be essentially the power star but that's a kind of a big if it's a little bit situational so um and you need yeah. you need bolster to be over something useful in that event Right, you need right. you need bolster mm -hmm. over something that you're going to do, and I would imagine you're going to need you're going to need some upgrades to be able to run an engine with just three workers, right? Yes, yeah, and it, yeah, kind of like I was mentioning before, Tagawa naturally wants to upgrade um, because of their starting worker, so uh, it it aligns well with that as as well. Um, also, they just have access to oil at the start of the game. Um, so yeah, generally you need to upgrade though when you do three workers just to reduce the cost of your bottom actions, um, to make your engine not suck. So, uh, <laughs> so let's take yeah. an example with this patriotic board over here. Um, yeah. Bolster is over the, the deploy. So that's actually a situation in which you might get that power star like you're talking about, but you could also go for the upgrade star because it's under move the way you, mm -hmm. you were discussing. If you were going to go with the worker star, I imagine you would want to try to circle back to those last produces. And perhaps if you were enlisting time, those last two produces to get the worker star. So the produce to five workers and then the produce to um, mm -hmm. eight workers, it'd be nice to be able to line those up with one of, um, either both or I guess just your last enlist if you've got a bunch of workers on the village. Yeah. Uh, actually, one thing that I see happens pretty often when you do three workers is rather than going from three to five to eight, you go from three to four to eight. So you put, you'll finish your bottom actions and then move one worker to a village, maybe produce once to finish that bottom action and then just move the rest of them to villages. 
And if you can spread out to a couple different villages and then produce, it's actually like your your workers are kind of already spread out when you're getting to eight workers, which is really nice for Tagawa because they can't really spread out a big pack of units very well. <laughs> like it just is not going to work well. So um, kind of going to eight workers on two different villages is another way that you can do that. Um, okay. But again, that is kind of pretty situation. When you say from four to eight, yeah. I was thinking, well, you got to hit six halfway there. You're talking about actually producing on two villages and actually yeah. um, going straight from four workers to eight workers. Right. So in a lot of cases, I guess that's going to be this village tunnel here. And Yeah, it's usually uh, both village. of these villages. Yeah. Um, but there are some rare cases where, like, I don't know, maybe you somehow get here or, you know, Rusfield's Village if they're not in the game. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's talk about the factory. Talk to us about the factory and what Tagawa thinks about the factory and wants to get out of the factory. Yeah, so the factory is amazing for Tagawa because it gives you speed. The thing that you're, you know, the whole reason everything is an uphill battle <laughs> is that you don't, you can't move two spaces at once. So once you get that, whole bunch of different options open up for uh attacking and uh just moving your units around for engine building as well so and also just anything related to movement just becomes easier once you get a factory card um and you can you know attack people more dynamically uh which is a big deal and also if you get a factory card that does bottom action it can help you finish your engine because uh, if you're if you're rushing to the factory, the sort of the idea is that like maybe you sacrifice how many bottom actions you do in the first eight or nine turns with the knowledge that like your factory card will help you finish those bottom actions that you didn't do. Um, and even if you're at the same time able to snag some encounters at the same time you're doing your factory action, you can maybe get two bottom actions in one turn and all of a sudden you're back in the game in terms of uh, racing to your bottom action stars. So, so you'd, um, you'd love to see a factory card that let you enlist or build or deploy a mech and you're not as happy if you've got a handful of three coins, um, right. two pop, a pop, mm -hmm. a coin, and a power, those sorts of things. Right. Yeah, I feel like for Tagawa, the bottom action factory cards are probably the most important than basically any faction in the game. Um, so the factory yeah. is amazing. The factory card's amazing for movement, for bottom row actions to help that engine. But then sometimes you don't get to go to the factory. Um, you get interrupted. You either get blocked on that mountain or that village tunnel. But so everyone's gotten to a point where, uh, and the strategy was brought up earlier that sometimes you want to you wanna go to Crimea's Tundra Tunnel, maybe, and... Mm -hmm. Crimea stuck in their base. Mm -hmm. um, when you get to that point where you either want to stop somebody like Crimea, I think it's usually Crimea, or you know you're not going to get to the factory, what mm -hmm. other sort of pathways, what are, your, what are your backup pathways for laying your traps and taking your character through the board? And, and how do you make the decision about when and how to pivot? Yeah. Sometimes it's kind of hard to see that you're not going to make it to the factory because you don't really know exactly what other people are going to do or if they're going to just go to the factory and then leave and then let you move on to it later. So like it's it's kind of hard to judge sometimes. So it depends on how far in the future you see it happening. But uh, in those situations, typically I, on with your the typical path of the factory, you can grab the, the Tundra encounter here. Um, if uh, Rusfeed is in the game, or maybe if they are in the game, <laughs> but uh, then even then you have to have some foresight and have Toka deployed, which is not usually one of the first mechs you deploy as uh, Tagawa. So um, it can be tough if somebody you know interrupts your plans to get to the factory. Um, another great one is a, a lot of the time you're actually on this tunnel when uh, you realize oh. I'm not going to be able to get to the factory. Just moving to any other tunnel is a huge pain in the butt to whoever you place a trap in front of. Uh, for Polania, this mountain is super important. 
Um, this is important for blocking Rusfiat into their home base, especially if you have traps on both of these tunnels. Mm -hmm. uh, really, the only way that Rusfiat can get out of their base is uh, through Township or triggering your traps. So, like, that's super annoying. And then, of course, this is only Crimea's only exit from their base. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's just a lot of when it, it actually. I kind of like a little bit when your your path to factory gets interrupted because it allows you some interesting freedom with what you do with the rest of your traps. And I'll just um, add that that double trap can be especially punishing to ag rust at agricultural because mm -hmm. one of the the sort of meta strats for rusty at agricultural goes for the power star and only builds two mechs mm -hmm. and suddenly if you don't have township to get out of your base and there are traps on that wood tunnel and that village mm -hmm. tunnel and units with ronin it can be very frustrating very quickly yeah this is uh this is actually maybe an underrated strategy because a lot of a lot of rest via strategies they sit in their base for 12 13 turns doing their bottom actions deploying their max and all of a sudden they're surrounded by traps <laughs> and like especially if you're like you you know you can do crazy stuff like this if they don't have uh a mech on there you can move in there place a trap on their village and then they can't get their eight workers or whatever they have to go to this village <laughs> you know like there's a lot of annoying stuff you can do to rust via there um but yeah so when when your path to the fa factory gets blocked um tunnels essentially become your friend is what i'm hearing from yes. you yeah either other trying to gain other encounters or tunnels and uh even uh because all the tunnels are next to encounters as well so mm. uh, yeah either across the river you know so so uh, let's let's talk. I know you wanted to talk about the power of Ronin and how to sort oh, yeah. of manipulate Ronin for your own benefit because it can. I mean, let's. I'm going to pivot over here to the the board real quick and zoom in on it. I'm sure people are familiar with it, but um, I mean, before combat, where you have exactly one unit gain two power, and it sounds like a little thing, but it it can be a big thing. Yeah, Ronin can be super powerful in certain situations, and uh, it can allow you to do some really weird plays. Uh, like, for instance, if you have a bunch of single mechs sort of scattered across the board, or even on a tunnel, just within reach of other people, which is a lot of the time your goal is, to is, is Tagawa, uh, is to just be next to people so that you could possibly attack them. And uh, one of the reasons for that is if you can engage in three combats in a turn, that's gaining six power uh, from engaging in three combats. So you might lose the first two, but you're also cycling a combat card in those two combats you lose, so it really increases the chance that you can win the third. So it's kind of a way to really to gain a lot of power very quickly in order to suddenly win a combat. It's uh generally a good surprise tactic because people see you're at like one or two power you're not a threat and then all of a sudden you're throwing combat stars to everybody and now you have control of the factory or something so like um there's some really fun things you can do with ronin in that regard also uh if you do have a decent amount of power uh in that same situation say you're at 10 power you can do the same thing and get a power star just from engaging in three combats. So you obviously can't spend any power in the first two, but you can spend it in the third. The way the rules work is you gain the star immediately when you reach 16 uh, power. So then you can spend it subsequently in the combat. So you can do a really, really sneaky, like two star turn by throwing two combats by just to gain power and then gain the power star with the third one. Um, and I've definitely ended a couple of games with that, and it feels very good. <laughs> can, that's just that's just something well, people don't see coming. They don't look at ten power on the board and say, "Well, that guy's about to get the power star." Um, they don't think that. No one. It's. I mean, I I, I wouldn't see that coming, honestly. In in many yeah, situations, wouldn't anticipate it. Um, so I've had people attack me. I feel like with Ronan and throw a combat just to have some power to produce when do you want to mm -hmm. do that and when do you want to be careful doing that um that's uh that, that's 
it's funny you bring that up because I actually wanted that to happen. I actually played Tigao Industrial in the final of the last tournament. Uh, and I was anticipating getting attacked uh, and then using that power I gained from Ronin in order to produce because I was at zero power. I thought for sure that somebody was going to attack me. Um, and I just wasn't quite in the position to throw a combat to somebody. So I ended up kind of screwing myself over a little bit assuming I was going to get a little power from Ronin, but um, it really, you have to be careful though, just like giving people free combat stars. Um, usually the rationale behind it is uh, they're going to eventually have to fight their way on the, the board to gain more territories or push opponents off of those territories anyway. So they're not really, it's not really going to change the speed of the game. But you have to, you do have to be careful about who you pick to throw a combat to. Like for instance, I I would very rarely do it towards Rusfia unless they already have two combat stars or Crimea unless they already have two combat stars. Um, and also that situation that arises not that often when basically everyone has two combat stars and has drained themselves of power and cards, uh, Tagawa is super powerful in that situation just because they sort of have this infinite source of power from Ronin so that you can continually uh, counterattack and like defend yourself because anytime you engage in combat, you're gaining something, um, which is uh, very powerful when you know everyone is sort of depleted from combat as well. So uh yeah ronin is great there's a lot of uh really fun things you can do with it uh. yeah so <laughs> you we talk about you talked about ronin about how powerful it can be in in long games where there are a lot of combats and you're you're draining people repeatedly um I and think, also teleporting back to traps and rearming them and you know all that shenanigans yeah i i mean it's it, it Especially that coin trap and in game, yeah. that coin trap can just be devastating when you keep rearming that thing on the factory because no one has any power to stop you. Um, one of the things that I, I know you you wanted to talk about, and this is uh, this is something that differs a little bit between the digital edition and playing on the tabletop simulator or in real life around the table. And that is one of the controversial things about the, the digital edition, for those of you who might be unfamiliar, is that at any point in the game in the digital edition, you can hit a drop down bar and see what the current score is. And mm -hmm. some people like it, some people hate it, some people say it ruins Scythe because Scythe is hard to calculate, and it's right. supposed to be. Uh, the counter argument to that is, well, with good players, they usually know what the score is anyway, just because they're calculating it up on somebody else's turn. Um, like it or hate it, the score counter has a difference, makes mm -hmm. a difference in how you play Tagawa. Because I know you wanted to talk about two different things. One mm -hmm. of them is winning by surprise as Tagawa. Yeah. And the other one was... Um, throwing a combat to force someone else to six stars to end the game and win the game. And I, I feel like the first one is more common if there's no score counter, and the second one is more common if there is one. Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we often joke in the Discord that like Tagao is the king of second place. Like They always get second because they have a decent score, but they can't control the end of the game. And one of the reasons why they always get second on digital edition is because of the score calculator, and that people know exactly how many points they need in order to beat you. And in real life, um, that uh, exacting calculation doesn't really exist. So a lot of those second places can turn into surprise wins, or at least a portion of them. So it kind of affects their win rate a little bit, um, even though, uh, like you said, experienced players will calculate pretty well um, what the actual scores are, but it can sometimes, Tagawa can be deceptive on like how many territories they control with the traps and if you have a pile of coins and, you know, if you have a decent, like if you're in tier two popularity, it can be a surprising amount of points um, if you don't have a calculator. Um, yeah, and then 
the second part of that, which is throwing combats to end the game, um, is I think probably it's tough to do as Tikawa because you actually have to be in a position to attack uh, somebody uh, without speed. And, you know, so that can actually be tricky sometimes, but uh, that uh, can be a big factor uh, in sort of uh, gaining sort of free combat stars and other things. Um, and uh, Tagawa is generally in a very good position to do that because of traps. They give you sort of a leg up in terms of territory score. So in general, you can have more points than a lot of factions, especially if you're focusing on moving a lot and you're spreading out early. Um, you can be in a position to essentially th like you know, throw a combat to uh, win the game. But uh, yeah. What I wanted to do now, though, is kind of pivot to a mm -hmm. discussion about not we're not going to go through a 16 turn sequence for every single mat but i thought maybe we could talk about each of the of the seven faction mats just a couple minutes on each one and just mm -hmm. kind of a rundown on what your early game goals are with them what your mid game goals are with them and what stars are you maybe going um, going for. That's it for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll uh, have the rest of the stream up pretty soon, and in it, we'll talk about the seven different Tagawa mats and go through some strategies that you can use for each one. So I hope you uh, enjoyed this video, and I'll see you on the next one. Thanks.